Welcome to Hit the Brakes with this Bill! Welcome to Hitting the Brakes with Moose and Bill, the outdoors edition. <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, not exactly break time at work, it's break from work, and uh, I'm heading home. It's a, it's a, I'm going that way. I'll eventually get there. So, Bill. I was thinking about dreams today, you know, do I have dreams and aspirations? Yes, I do. For the longest time, I didn't know what it was, and I kind of got into a, a rut of, uh, this is what I'm doing with my life. I didn't exactly want to start working at Walmart, but you know, it was something to do at the time I needed to work. And, uh, apparently, I was really good at it. Yeah, I can't blame Walmart for anything. I had no problems with Walmart. They gave me a job. They asked me to do a job. I did the job. I worked hard. They paid me. You know, I held up my end. They held up there. Can't really ask for more than that. See if I don't get hit by a car. Well, it has taken a toll on my body. I still work like I'm 25. But by the time I get home, I feel like I'm 75. Again, I didn't really know what I wanted to do or that I really could do anything else until I met some wonderful people. James Hancock and Tony Stella and started just talking to them. And uh, <laughs> they were nice enough to talk back. Not everybody talks back. Look at that. Look at my crazy eyebrow, it's sticking out. People always say, hey Moose, your freaking eyebrows, you need to trim them. And I'm like, dude, those are my those are my eyebrows of power. Huh? You didn't ask Samson to cut his hair, did you? And through them, I met a number of wonderful people, including my partner, Bill Scurry, my buddy. All of you played a wonderful part in me discovering a little something about myself. With the help of Victor Rodriguez, one of the people I met through James, who we played D&D &D with, with Martin Kessler and uh, Dan the Man Pullen, and Adam Rakoff, my man. Victor Rodriguez, he let me do uh, a cover, like the audio version of one of the stories that was in Savage Realms Monthly. And then I did it. Next thing you know, I'm in contact with the owner of Savage Arms Monthly, and he loves what I did and wants to know if I can do it again, and I did. I am now the official narrator for all of the Savage Realms Monthly publications, which is awesome. It's a small team, and I am proud to be a member of that. Now here's the thing. I've gotten such a taste and a desire to do this audio work that that's really all I want to do. Now my dream is to stop working at Walmart and do audio work and voice acting full time. Now I just got to figure out how to do it. Taking little steps here and there, I want to, I want to ramp that up, because frankly, I don't want to spend Thanksgiving stocking shelves anymore. I'd like to have it with my family every year now and Christmas. You know, 
and every day because I, my daughter turns 18 this year and this year was the first time I ever had a full Thanksgiving with her. And it was wonderful. We spent the entire day and night together. And I want that to happen every year now. So, this is officially me saying I'm going to ramp it up and try to devote all my time to making this dream of leaving where I currently work and pursuing voice acting full time. That's going to be a challenge, definitely. So this wasn't exactly a hit in the bricks and boots of Bill, was it, Bill? <laughs> what do you think of all this, my man? You're my partner. My dogs know I'm home. Bruce, let me tell you a story about a man named Bill Scurry. Um, I came from a very modest middle-class background, uh, a lot of non-achieving in my family. Um, I believe it's safe to call it either at least working class, I'd say working poor. Um, it's strange. I didn't think anything of somebody who sort of had transient work, you know, like a job for two years, kind of dropped it, picked something else up. Mostly things that nobody was happy doing uh, because there wasn't the idea that in, in anywhere in my family that you were sort of either qualified or there's an expertise. It was merely, it was labor, it was work, purely labor. My dad uh, bust his ass uh, at a, a machine shop factory on Long Island where they made gigantic, like, they had these die-cast machines that kicked out um, essentially pieces for other machines that did fabricating, you know, this massive assembly line. I don't know exactly know what his gig was there. I knew it was really hard to do. He definitely bust his ass. He'd come home exhausted. His clothes would be torn and scuffed. He needed steel-toe boots because, you know, you were sort of in the, the danger of getting of shit falling on you and breaking bones all day, that kind of thing. I'm sure the labor laws in the 80s were lax. Um... You know, the thing is, my dad was a guy who worked with his hands anyway. What he loved to do was fix cars. What he loved to do was carpentry, plumbing, electric. He wasn't a deep man. He's actually a bad man, but that's a different story. He he wasn't a deep man, but there was some art to working with his hands. He, he built our house two times over. Um, I don't know where he learned these things from, but his, his woodworking was fine. His electric was fine. The things that he built and rebuilt... His carpentry, it, 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 it lasted. It was actually nice looking. There was an aesthetic thing to it. There was a pride in that. I just don't think that there was necessarily a way for him to understand that that was either an art form or more than just a job. It was an avocation. My mom didn't really have work. My mom was a waitress. She worked at Friendly's restaurants on the East Coast here. She fucking hated that shit. You know, it, she hated people as it was anyway, but it just, this, you know, com this complete dyspepsia. With dealing with with idiot people in a restaurant asking you to fix shit that or they would like blow their nose in hamburger buns behind in the kitchen and put the food back, reserve it to people if they complained about the food. Real vile stuff, but it's it's all true, or at least it was true. I don't know what they do now. I think my point is is that when it came time for me to decide what I wanted to do, I had no no uh, you know there was no north star to figure out what the fuck I, I was supposed to do with my life. The only thing my dad ever said, and he only said it one time, he said, he said, Billy, don't, he goes, get a nice desk job. Don't do something like this. But I'm not so sure he said it like, I hate what I'm doing. I, he may have more said like, you're not suited for this. <laughs> Could have been the case. And he was right, if that was the truth. But like, well, what, what, what was there to do? I knew that I had to go to college. Um, you know, I wasn't cut out for armed forces, that sort of thing. Uh... But no one in my family really been to college before. Also, in 1993, it, it was expensive in 93. I mean, it's fucking Looney Tunes now. So the thing is, I didn't know where to go or what to study. I think I just thought, like, well, it's school. I'll just keep going to 13th grade. I mean, maybe somebody there will tell me what I'm supposed to do when I get there. I had no canniness. I had no idea. I didn't know that you could get a job in Manhattan working in a newspaper or that in 95, I did an internship at Marvel Comics, right? As part of college. I was at school for two years until somebody said, you know, you can make comic books like a career. 
And I just didn't understand. I thought you had to be given a job by Queen Elizabeth, essentially, like the sword tap on each on each shoulder. He, I dub you the fucking editor of Iron Man. I'm like, you can get a job. There's an expertise and a training. And you, you can actually two years into a fucking college. I was paying ten thousand dollars a year for until I actually learned that that's look. it's not the point. I didn't get into Marvel Comics, but I was like, oh, if only I had been positioning my entire life to doing something that I knew I wanted to do, you know, rather than, I don't know, whatever just kind of, whatever shit ran downhill my way, maybe I could have done something like That's a backstop, a level of comfort that I couldn't even imagine were, you know, living with. The idea of the safety net of like, I can afford to make a mistake. I could afford to have gone into filmmaking, you know, which I tried for 10 years. I could have afforded to do that years and years earlier. It just wasn't an option because I had to get a fucking job. The job I picked was in newspapers, and that fell through. That, that thing was over in 2010, thereabouts. I don't know, man. You're walking through the snow. I'm sitting here with Cobra Commander. It made me think of these things, but I don't know if it, I don't necessarily know it was any easier for you if you had the, the determination to figure out what you wanted to do came so late that now you're in this this catbird seat, but you're an old man like me trying to figure out how the fuck do you make something of it when you're fighting against younger people. That's a tough one. That's why I canned filmmaking. I'm like, I can't do this shit. I got to figure something else out. I, I don't even know, man. Hey, but I'm glad you sent a message. This is a good habit. I, I, I enjoy this. It's a good routine. Also, it looks like you're walking through the Yukon, so... Uh... Frickin' trim my eyebrows. Trim you.